Bible study today. Come on, bro. Yeah. Talk talkie. Hey, man. And then two hours of work after four. Come on. Talk that talk. Luke chapter 4, amen? Come on, bro. Come on, Let's go so big chapter 4. <laughs> I want to talk a little bit tonight about really what are we? Ooh. What are we? Ooh. We are the resistance. Ooh. Ooh. We're the resistance. Here's the reality of our lives. We, we don't see it, but I, I hope tonight... To be able to pull the curtain back a little bit so that you can see the reality of what's going on around us. Wow. We are people, we are men and women who have been born into a world at war. Mm. Wow. Now, the rea now, you can look around this world and go, yeah, there's this war that's happening, there's that war that's happening, there's this situation and that situation, this skirmish and that skirmish, all the cyber warfare that's going on, all that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From a, from, a, from a physical perspective, there is truth that we are at war on some level. There would be no need for the CIA, the FBI, all these intelligence agencies. There would be no need for any of these things if there was not a war of some kind going on. Mm. Wow. But we are born not just into a world at physical war, mm. we have been born into a world in spiritual war. Mm. Wow. Now Satan does not consider whether or not you want to be a part of this war or not. He's not like trying to get recruits. Because the reality is that we're born onto his side. Yeah. Wow. Period. Wow. wow. Now there's a point in time where, you know, you, you, you're kind of like young and innocent. You know what I mean? Right? Like Giannis right now, he's like in the neutral zone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm -hmm. But there comes a time in each and every person's life where you pick a side. Mm -hmm. And Satan doesn't care what side you pick. He's not going, mm -hmm. he doesn't really want this, so... Like, in the physical military, Rocky can tell you, if you don't want to be there, you, you put in your time and then you're gone. That's it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you don't want to be there, depending on what you do, they'll boot you out. Mm -hmm. Wow. So you have a choice in the matter. Yeah. None of us have a choice. We are fighting on one side or the other. He is fighting for your soul, and you, in some way, shape, or form, are either not resisting, or you are resisting. Wow. But here in this room, what you've come to tonight, this is the resistance. Oh, the title of our lesson tonight is Join the Resistance. Oh. Now in this resistance, we have two objectives, only two. Two objectives, that's it. Real simple. Real simple. If we're going to win this war, we have two things that we need to do. Point number one is, we got to set the captives free. Come on, bro. Yeah. Luke chapter 4. Look here at verse 16. Let's go. Come on, bro. Let's go. He went to Nazareth, this is Jesus, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom. It's kind of nice that Jesus had a custom of going to church, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Some of us need to get that custom, you know what I mean? Okay. Ain't on time at church, you know what I mean? Oh, no. Maybe, maybe, maybe like fully participating in church. You know? oh. Maybe like singing and stuff. You know? oh. When Jay's up here talking about, you know, uh, uh, I got the joy down in my heart, like that it actually like comes from, not just stays down in your heart where nobody can see it, but it like comes up onto your face. You know? oh. to go to the synagogue, which would be our vernacular church. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, you guys ever wonder where the word scroll came from on your phone? No. I'm scrolling. Yeah. Wow. 
because a big scroll, you would open it up and you'd have to roll. It, you would roll the top oh, yeah. and unroll the bottom. Dang. So you'd have to wow. do kind of a this thing. Wow. And so, scrolling. Wow. Some of y'all kids don't understand nothing. That's cool. <laughs> they don't understand none of that. You don't know a world without scroll. <laughs> this kind of scroll. Scroll it. Some of us don't. Well, I, none of us know a world with this kind of scroll. I do remember when you when you you would touch your screen on your phone and it would do nothing. And it was about this big. I feel the pain. Not even that big. Maybe like an inch by inch by inch, and all we could do was play snake. Yes. Wow, you just want to remember that. And, and, and if you wanted to text somebody, if you wanted to text somebody, you had to like hit the button until you got like, if you, if you look at the, the, the dial pad, it was A, B, C, D, E, F, G, E, H, R, right? So if you didn't say E, A, B, C, D, E, I had to hit the two button twice. To get to my first letter. Yeah. But man, I could I could do some serious like some of y'all got your iPhones and stuff and you're like bah, 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 bah. I could do some serious nasty stuff on that that Nokia. Yeah. You know what I mean? That's right. like this big. So we all don't know. Let's get back to the text. <laughs> Unrolling it, he found the place where it's written. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. Yeah. Now think about this for a minute. Wow. Homie's sitting down. <laughs> then he just gets up, and some dude just hands him a scroll. It just happens to be Isaiah. Mm. Now, back in the day, there was it was just... The scroll of Isaiah was, there was no book, there was no chapters, there was no verses. So he couldn't have like just scrolled, oh, okay, Isaiah 61, right? So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, okay, there's 61, verse 4. You, 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 you couldn't do that. How long did it take him oh. to scroll through that thing and find I, the, the, the verse 61, which is, the, or the chapter 61 that he's reading here, Wow. So he gets there, and then he reads it, silence, scrolls it back, sits down. <laughs> wow. That's it. I mean, how would that be if I came up, I read a scripture, and I sat back down? <laughs> It'd be weird. <laughs> I should. That sounds cool. I might. That, that, that'd, be, that'd, be, that'd be a comedic uh, a situation there. <laughs> But it said, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And then everybody, it says, the eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying that, so now he starts to teach from that sitting position. Now it's a circular thing, so it's not like he'd be sitting there and his back was to everybody. It says, today, the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. This is the theme of Jesus' ministry. This is his manifest destiny. This was his whole point and purpose for coming on earth. This was his mission. This was his purpose. This is why he came. Isn't that what it said? Because he has sent me to, what? Sing songs and clap and go to work and get a paycheck and buy an iPhone and Listen to music and no, all those things aren't wrong. They're not bad, but Jesus has a singular purpose. Come on, he did not come just to sing some songs. He didn't come to perform some wizard magic, say some cool things, and leave. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But to set captives free. Let's go, Come on. The people of Israel did not even agree with this because they didn't even believe. That they had indeed a need to be freed. Mm. Wow. We know this from John 8, where the Jesus is like, hey, then you'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. And they were all up in arms. What? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> we have Abraham as our father. Oh. Oh, we've not been slaves to anyone. Oh, no, no. Whoa, 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 hold on, hold on. You've never been a slave to anyone. Let's uh, let's roll back the clock a little bit. 
Whose Ooh. occupation are you living under right now? Rome. Oh. Not to mention you were under occupation for 430 years from the Egyptians. We'll get to that in a minute. But here's the situation. He was surrounded by people who, who just thought that that life that they were living was normal. Mm. This is the way that it is. Wow. The same is the situation that we live in today. If we're going to believe the scriptures, we have to believe what Jesus is setting forth right here. That everyone has been taken captive by Satan, and we are here. The resistance is here on, to bro. proclaim good news to the poor, to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, proclaim the year of the Lord's favor for what purpose? To set the oppressed free. Come on, bro. But how do we know that everybody's enslaved? Well, John 8, 34 says, Very truly I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Mm. The very same words that Jesus gave to these very same people who said, we're, we're not slaves to anybody. Mm. He's like, yes, you are. You're a slave to sin. Wow. Mm. Sin is not something that we can just cut out whenever we want. We have no choice in the matter. Or do we? Everyone is a slave to whatever has mastered them. You know, I've been reading through the Bible. I, every year I read through the Bible. Last year I read it just from cover to cover. This year I'm reading it in chronological order. On top of the other, you know, quiet time stuff that I have. And uh, we'll get into the reason why I'm preaching this. Because I just got done reading about Moses and the captivity in Egypt. And they're, they're just at the scene where they just got on the other side of the Red Sea. So mm -hmm. we're going to dive into Exodus chapter 1. Mm -hmm. But I want you to look here in Revelation chapter 3 before we get there. Come on, bro. All right, bro. Everyone is a slave to whatever had mastered them. You know, the, the brothers got together on Wednesday. Yeah. Were the brothers here on Wednesday? Yeah. Yeah. And we looked at being our brother's keeper, oh, yeah. which is from Genesis chapter 4. See, we read about the first sin ever committed was a sin against God, destroying the very fabric of humanity. The second sin in the Bible destroyed brotherhood because yeah. one brother killed another brother. Yeah. Wow. And the words that God says to Cain is, sin wants to rule over you, but you must master it. Mm. So either you're being mastered by sin or sin is, or sin is mastering you or you're mastering the sin in your life. Yeah. Wow. The story of people's lives all around us <coughs> is that Sin is their master. Sin is mastering them. Revelation 3, look here in verse 17. It says, you say I'm rich. I've acquired wealth. And do not need a thing, but you do not realize. You do not see. You do not understand that you're a captive in need of being released. You do not understand that you are oppressed. But you are rich and pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. And Jesus goes on to say, I beg you. To get something to heal your eyes so that you can see exactly where you are at. The wow. Bible says that the world is under the power of the evil one. That he has blinded the eyes of unbelievers so they, they cannot see where they really are at. This is why when people start studying the Bible and God begins to reveal things. So this is why John 8, 31, 32, he says to the Jews who believed him, if you hold to my teachings, you're really my disciples, then you'll know the truth and the truth will set you free. You don't know the truth and then all of a sudden become a disciple and be said, no, 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 there's a process to this. Mm -hmm. Come on, you receive more and more insight. Mm -hmm. God gives you the insight to see, man, I need God. Yeah. I need to go to church. I need to get a right relationship with God or find out what this is all about. All of us at one time had this thought, this aching in our heart. The Bible says that he's put eternity in the hearts of men. Wow. Why? So that we will understand when the deep recesses of our sin, laying in at night on our beds, we would go, there's got to be something more. There's got to be a purpose behind all this. Yeah. 
And that would lead us to God. And then God puts a disciple in our path. And as that disciple begins to call us to obey the scriptures, more and more of the scriptures get opened up to us. It's not a foreign language anymore. Not just because we got rid of the King James Version, which we never understood anyway, went with like a new international version. Something a little bit more readable. But because, because in our obedience, we started to become disciples. And as we start to become disciples, what does Jesus say? Then you will know the truth. Yeah. And the truth will set you free, which is why he came. Come on. But these men and women in the book of Revelation that Jesus is talking to here, they thought that they were fine. Now what's sad is that these people were inside of the church. You know the most religious people in the world are going to go to hell quicker than the pagans. Because they know the truth. They think they're fine. I can't tell you how many people we've studied the Bible with here so far that think they're fine. Yeah. And yet their life is glaringly opposed to the gospel. Yeah. It's obvious. Yeah. The Bible says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Yeah. You can't sleep with your girlfriend and say you're a Christian. Right. You can't smoke weed every day and say you're a Christian. Yeah. You can't have a mouth like a sailor and say you're a Christian. Come on, bro. Right. You can't be prejudiced and racist and any kind of is that you want to talk about and say Come you're on. a Christian. Yeah. Come on, bro. You can't. Yeah. Come on, bro. Preach that. You can't put your kids and your wife and your family the very first thing in your priority list and say you're a Christian. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that right there probably would be probably the most controversial thing I've said today. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. God has to be number one. Yeah. yeah. And so what happens to people around us, they, they've got all this, they're rich. Maybe not monetarily, but they feel rich. I got it. I got all the love from Jesus I need. This feels so good. Yeah, I just, you know, just blew it in my purity. I just, I just, yeah, but, but there's so much grace. I'm so grateful for the grace. And yes, we have grace. And this is why Romans 6, Paul says, don't go sinning. So that you can get more grace. Wow. His grace is not a get out of hell free card. His grace actually is supposed to teach us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions. Yeah. Right. Whether you believe it or not, this message is the same for everyone. Come on, bro. Yeah. Come on. I have a goal as I do every year, like I said, to read the Bible in a year. Exodus chapter 1. We're going to dive into... A, a physical reality that happened in history that mirrors the spiritual reality of where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Exodus chapter 1. Wow. Look here in verse 6. Come on, bro. Now Joseph and all his brothers and all that generation died, but the Israelites were exceedingly fruitful. They multiplied greatly, increased in number, became so numerous that the land was filled with them. Then a new king, whom Joseph meant nothing, came into power in Egypt. Look, he said to the people, the Israelites have become far too numerous for us. Come, let's deal shrewdly with them. Or they will become even more numerous, and, will, and if war breaks out, will join our enemies, fight against us, and leave the country. So they put slave masters over them, to oppress them with forced labor. And they built Pinnam and Ramses as store cities for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, and that's the same thing for the disciples, amen? On, the more bro. that the world oppresses us, the more we multiply. Come on, bro. So the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites and worked them ruthlessly. They made their lives bitter with harsh labor and brick and mortar and with all kinds of work in the fields. And all their harsh labor, the Egyptians worked them ruthlessly. This is how Satan works. To work us so hard that we have no escape, even in our thoughts. How many of us who have full-time jobs or go to school on, on a regular basis, like we go to sleep waking, thinking about work, we wake up thinking about work. Yeah. You know, we sing a song, I woke up this morning with my mind set on Jesus. No, 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 you woke up this morning thinking about your budget oh. spreadsheets, thinking about that meeting oh, that you no. had with the boss. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 
Look how hard we and our parents are working. You know, back when I was growing up, it was 9 to 5, Monday through Friday, that was it. Now, now there were some times that you, you know, maybe went in from a 6.30 to 2.30 or 7 to 3.30 or something like that. But you, you worked your 8, Monday through Friday, and that was it. Nobody worked on a Saturday. Mm-hmm. Nobody worked on Sunday. Mm-hmm. It was 40 hours in the, yeah, 40 hours might have been like Monday to Friday, it could have been Tuesday to Saturday, whatever it was. But there was a there was a limit to your work. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now people are bragging about working 80 hours a week, 60 hours a week. <laughs> no nights, no weekends, nights, weekends, 24 hours. Now we got where people are working multiple jobs just to make ends meet. Yeah. And then they got a side hustle. Right? They've got their normal normal job, and then they do Uber on the side, or they do Lyft, or they do this, or they do that. Mm. Yeah. Oh, bro. With all that happening, where are we going to have time for God Ooh. when there's so much busy work to do? In uh-huh. oh, Exodus, Pharaoh is the Satan character, teaching us how Satan is working spiritually. Go to chapter 2, verse 23. During that long period, the king of Egypt died. The Israelites groaned in their slavery and cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up to God. This is 400 plus years later. God heard their groaning, and he remembered his covenant with Abraham, with Isaac, and with Jacob. So God looked on the Israelites and had concern about them. God hears his people's cry for help, and you know what his answer was? One dude. Mm. One dude. Mm. That's it. It wasn't like, okay, guys, we got to muster this army. We're going to go do some crazy things, man. Get wow. your sword. Get your you know, shield. Like, let's do this. Angel armies, let's ascend. <laughs> no, man. He found one dude gathering sheep in the desert. Wow. Shows up in a burning bush. And it just so happened, like you read the story, and it, you can read it on your own, but like you, you, it just so happened Moses is curious. There's a burning bush over there. I wonder what's going on. <laughs> it was Moses' curiosity. It wasn't like God was saying, I am the Lord, come thou unto the burning bush, and I shall tell you what I have for you to do. No. <laughs> he was just like kicking it with the sheep, and then bam, he sees this burning you know, tree over here. And he's like, well, that's weird. I've never seen a burning tree before. And it's not even burning. It was Moses' curiosity. God is weird, guys. Come on, bro. I mean, it's just, you, you can't read the Bible like a phone book. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you gotta like put yourself yeah. in. Like, that's weird. Yeah. Wow. And Moses is like, that's weird. Let's go check it. Look at it. Come on, bro. Okay. Come on, bro. Come on. Let's check it. And then so Moses has this conversation with God, and God's like, hey, I'm See the misery of my people. I, I need somebody to go there and like handle business for me. And Moses is like, man, you gotta send somebody else. Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. I don't even know how to talk right. Ooh. Which is a complete lie to God, right? We know from the book of Acts that Moses actually spent 40 years being schooled and educated by the very people right. he was gonna go and tell right. to set his people free. Right. Right. Military commander, he he'd done so many things for the Egyptians. Yeah. So it was a cop out. Yeah. Like, hey, wow. and, and God is so gracious. God is so gracious with our excuses, is he not? Yes. Oh. He's like, okay, man, look. You're gonna go. Like, you don't have a choice in the matter, buddy. You're gonna go. But you know what? I already called your brother Aaron. He's on his way to meet you. He's going to speak for you, okay? So you tell him what, I'm going to tell you what to say, you tell Aaron what to say, and then Aaron's going to tell Pharaoh, okay? I'm going to just eliminate your excuses. (laughs) Finally, Moses obeyed with the help of his brother. They set him on this mission from God. Go to chapter 5, verse 4. Let's go. Come on, bro. Come on, bro. Come on. Exodus 5, verse 4 says, But the king of Egypt said, Moses and Aaron, why are you talking to people? Taking them away from their labor. Get back to your work. 
Now what's crazy is that Moses and Aaron, I, if it was me, I'd be like, dude, I don't work for you. <laughs> but because they identified with the people of Israel, it was their work. Then Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are now numerous, and you are stopping them from working. That same day, Pharaoh gave his order, this order, to the slave drivers and overseers in charge of the people. You are no longer to supply the people with straw for making bricks. Let them go and gather their own straw, but require them to make the same number of bricks as before. Don't reduce the quota. They are lazy. That is why they are crying out. Let us go and sacrifice to our God. Make the work harder for the people so that they, that they keep working and pay no attention to lies. Oh, wow. wow. You know, something struck me as I was writing this is all these different layoffs that are happening just north of us yeah. in Silicon Valley. And I think what's interesting is that Satan has a hand in this. Yes, it's the economy. Yes, it's political this and political that. Yes, it's, you know, inflation. Yes, it's all these different things. But who's behind all this? Who's behind all this? So now you have people who don't have jobs. <coughs> Amen. Let's go reach out to them. But now you've got a whole bunch of other people who are still working for those companies that now are required to do just as much work that they had before, but now with less people on their team. Wow. You know what's crazy, even for me personally, is I'm a contract worker, and so my contract is up in the, in the beginning of March. Mm -hmm. And I got an email from the company that I work for, and they're like, hey, good, good news. We are going to sign this contract, so this is awesome which technically means that everybody gets to keep their job on this, on this team that we have. But if you read between the lines, as I like to do, <laughs> sometimes it's in a not good way, but most of the time it's in a good way. So I kick an email off to the, the gal who's you know, running our contract. I said, hey, so does this mean that all of the resources get to keep their jobs? Or are there gonna be some restructuring? Because I, I heard, because I'm kind of in the know, uh, with this group that I work for, uh, you know, do, are there going to be, a, there, there was going to be some budget cuts, but I know we lost a couple people that got other jobs elsewhere, and so does that kind of even things out, and I'm trying to get the inside scoop, and essentially she said, I'll find out on the 10th whether everybody keeps their job. Oh. Oh. So that's awesome that the company gets to sign their contract with, with the, the company we're contracting with, but that doesn't mean everybody who has signed a contract with the company who signed a contract gets to keep their contract. Does this make sense? Wow. Yeah. So even for me, if I get to keep my job, there's going to be people that are on my team that lose their job. Does that change the amount of work that we have to do on this team? No. Oh my gosh. So even though the, the amount of people doing the work goes down, the work doesn't change. It's just the same way thousands of years ago. Wow. Right. Give them wow. work to do. That, no, you're going to be called to do the same work, only I'm not going to provide you all of the resources you need to get the job done. Wow. But you still need to get it done. There it is. Wow. You know, you can continue to read the story on your own, but Pharaoh doubles down when Moses comes with a call to set the captives free. And so what does God do? God goes, no, 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 no. I'm going to get glory from this. And my people are going to do what I've asked them to do. And you're going to do what I've asked you to do, Pharaoh. Mm. And so he sends plague after plague after plague after plague after plague. And finally, Pharaoh's like, fine. Go. Now it cost Pharaoh his kid. Yeah. But he said, fine. Mm. But here's the crazy thing. As soon as they are outside of Egypt, actually freed from slavery... They get afraid and begin to freak out when Pharaoh comes to his senses and goes, whoa, 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 we, we just let all these people go. Mm. This is stupid. <laughs> and he comes back to take a captive. Look at chapter 14. Come on, bro. Come on. It says, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified and cried out to the Lord. They said to Moses, 
Was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us into the desert to die? What have you done to us by bringing us out of Egypt? Didn't we say, leave us alone? Let us serve the Egyptians? Which, by the way, they didn't say that. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. Here's the problem. This is the same truth with so many people that we study the Bible with who hear the truth. They want to be set free. Initially, they're like, this is awesome. I've never been taught this before. I don't know why my grandma or my pastor or Uncle Bob or whomever didn't share this with me when, wow. when they said the Bible with me. Come on, bro. But then it starts to get real. Yeah. 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 Then they actually start to have to live like a free person. Wow. And not a slave. Not a slave to the opinions of others. Not a slave to the, uh, to the, to the dogmatic doctrines, false doctrines of their, their church or their parents or, or the people around them. And they start to get afraid. I can totally relate. I totally get it. Wow. But they're too afraid wow. to do it because it, of the changes that it affects in their lives. Upon being set free, this is the people's response. I would rather be a slave than to die free. And then they immediately turn to accuse God and his people. The very people that are bringing freedom, the very freedom fighters, the very resistance, it's their fault that I can't be free now. No, 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 no. it's your fault. It's your choice. All the resistance, all Moses and Aaron did was bring the truth, to bring the freedom. Yeah. This is what we're fighting against. Come on. We're not fighting against sin. We're fighting against the sinful nature. Mm. Wow. Because the sinful nature is a mind bent on the habits of sin. The mind focused on ways of medicating from the pain. And when things start to get hard, when things start to get difficult, we go right back to people pleasing. Mm. We go right back to the comforts wow. of relationships, whoever that may be. We go right back to the very things that enslaved us in the first place. Wow. It's not the sin. It's not the acts of the flesh that we're fighting. It's the flesh itself. It's the habits, it's the mindsets, it's the skill sets that you've built up over the years to medicate yourself from feeling pain. Wow. When the word cuts, we run. When the word cuts, we fight. Mm. Versus wow. just surrendering to the pain. Wow. Versus yeah. just surrendering to what God wants to do in healing. It's a good pain. Mm. It's a good mm. pain. Why has God invited us to join the resistance and to save the prisoners? Mm. Because that's all the nation needs. Wow. Just one person. Mm. Come on, bro. One person. Mm. That was all that God needed to free almost two million people. Was one guy willing to go and take a stand wow. to the most powerful human being in the world at that time. Wow. And that's you and me. It's us waking up in the morning, choosing to go and tell Pharaoh, to go and tell Satan in the dominion of darkness, set my people free, let my people go. Come on, bro. Fighting with true worshipers, with the help of our brothers and sisters, pulling them out of slavery. Satan has so much more power than us individually. But it's us choosing individually to band together and be the resistance. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Come on, bro. Objective number two Objective. is on, to bro. destroy the work of Satan. Exodus 14, mm. look here in verse 15. Mm. Destroy the work of Satan. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Contrary to popular belief, most, God does not understand our drama. We cry out to God so much over stupid stuff. And amen, keep crying out to him, okay? He's not, like, like unmerciful, okay? okay. But God, God, you understand why this is so hard. I don't understand. <laughs> I, I don't. Now, I love you enough to, like, listen to what you have to say. But I don't get this. 
I sent my son to die for you, to set you free, and you're whining because you have to wake up at 7 o'clock instead of 10 o'clock so that you have enough time to have a quiet time before you go to class. Ooh. Ooh. You, you've allowed Satan to bully you into jacked up relationship after jacked up relationship after jacked up relationship. And so homey comes back into your life and you actually are entertaining going back with him? But I, but I set you free. I, I don't understand. Mm. Right. I don't get that. That doesn't make... The, 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 the logic does not make sense to me. Mm. So God's telling Moses, like, why are you crying out to me? I'm here, dude. I set you free. Yeah. Tell the other wives to move on. Yeah. Raise your staff. Stretch out your hand over the sea and divide the waters so that the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. I'll harden the hearts of the Egyptians so that they will go in after them, and I will gain glory through Pharaoh and all his army. Though this chariots and his horsemen, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord when I gain glory through Pharaoh, his chariots, and his horsemen. Skip down to verse 21. When Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and all that night the Lord drove the sea back with his strong east wind and turned it into dry land. Wow. The waters were divided, and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground and with a wall of water on the right and a wall of water on the left. The Egyptians pursued them, and all of Pharaoh's horses and chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire and clouded the Egyptian army and threw it into confusion. He jammed the wheels of their chariots so that they had difficulty driving. And then the Egyptians said, let's go away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for, the, for them against Egypt. So they finally got it. Whoa, hey, hey. Let's not do this anymore, guys. Let's just let them go. <laughs> and the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so that the waters may flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and horsemen. Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at daybreak the sea went back to its place. The Egyptians were fleeing toward it. And the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back and covered the chariots and the horsemen, the entire army of Pharaoh, that had followed the Israelites into the sea. Not one of them survived. But the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses his servant. Wow. Mm. That's, awesome. That's awesome. Isn't that nuts? That's crazy. That's crazy. Moses was one man who took a stand to resist the army of Pharaoh. Mm. The people would have turned around and bowed back to their slave masters. Hey, take us back. We're sorry we followed this Yahoo. This just, we don't know who he is. We, we got no identity with this guy. Just take us back. Mm. Mm. But Moses had all the faith that they needed. Wow. One guy. Mm. You don't even see Aaron in the picture here. Aaron's not wow. like, bro, we got this, dude. Wow. It's just Moses. Yeah. Wow. He closes them in, and the entire army is destroyed. Mm. Here's the reality of our lives. God has the power to destroy the work of Satan. But he is waiting for you and for me to have the faith to do it. Come on, bro. Wow. Persecution is proof we're doing something right. Yeah. But when it gets hot, it can be hard to bear no matter how strong we believe. Mm. We can find ourselves asking God to like, hey, let it up a little bit. Mm. <coughs> but we are tougher than that. With God, we can destroy the very strongholds of Satan in this city. Yeah. With God, we can destroy the very stronghold of Satan in our schools, yeah. on, in bro. our workplaces, and in Come our on. families. Yeah. Come on, bro. God knows that all he needs is a small group of faithful disciples filled with faith, willing to take their stand, and he will destroy the work of Satan. Write down these passages. Come on, bro. This Come is on. why Jesus came, and this is why we are sent out in Jesus' name. On, 1 John 3, verse 8 says, The one who does what is sinful is of the devil, because the devil has been sinning from the beginning. But check this out. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the devil's work. Wow. Hebrews 2, verse 14 to 15 says, Since the children have flesh and blood, 
he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. See, that's the thing, is our fear of death. The Egyptians feared dying in the wilderness. But we fear dying to ourselves and doing what God wants us to do. Wow. wow. Because we want to do what we want to do. We think that that's life. Mm -hmm. Luke 9, 23 says, Then he said to them all, this is Jesus, Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross daily and follow me. There is no might to deny themselves or has a choice to deny themselves. No, no, no. Yeah. The, the, the cover charge to Christianity is denial of self. Mm. Yeah. Come on, bro. Yeah. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. Meaning, if you want to keep the life that you're living right now, go for it. You're going to lose it in the end. Mm. Wow. But whoever loses their life for me will save it. Now, now there's a key phrase. I want you to circle that in your Bible. Lose their life for me. Mm. There's a bunch of people that deny themselves today. Yeah. In fact, there's a, there's a big movement going on, if you're paying attention, where men are like being called, you need to go to the gym. You need to, you need to be pure. Right? Women, you, you, need to, you need to hold on to your integrity. Wait for that right man. Make him work for it. And I say amen to all that. Oh. Right? Self-discipline. We follow people like, like Andrew Tate or Jocko Willink or some of these guys, and it's all about self-discipline. It's all about doing the right thing and having integrity. And it's a big, big thing nowadays. But here's the problem. But whoever loses their life for Jocko, whoever loses their life so that they can get good grades, whoever loses their life so that they can get a good job, make good money, buy that house, whoever lose their life to take care of their parents, whoever lose their life... No, 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 no. Jesus didn't say whoever's super disciplined and super on top of things and, and is a really good employee or a really good this or a really good that. That's not what he's saying. Now, we should all strive to be excellent in everything that we do, but he's saying, no, 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 no. You've got to lose your life for me. Come on. For wow. Jesus. Come on, bro. Wow. Come on, bro. We'll save it. Yep. Wow. You can be a good moral person and you'll still go to hell. Yep. Wow. Because you're not doing it for Jesus. You're doing it for you. Wow. No matter how nor noble your ambition might be, it's not for Jesus. Mm. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world? And yet lose or forfeit the very self. Whoever is ashamed of me and my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his glory and the glory of the Father and the holy angels. Here's what's the scariest thing about this passage is that by me not denying myself, not taking up my cross, choosing to save my life right now rather than lose it right now, I'm showing Jesus that I am ashamed of him. Wow. And there's no ambiguity in this passage. If I'm ashamed of Jesus here and now, He's going to be ashamed of me when he comes back. What does that mean? I'm not going to get into the pearly gates. I'm not going to get into heaven. It's a salvation issue if I don't deny myself and take up my cross and lose my life for him. Wow. Are we ashamed of Jesus? Even inside of the resistance, are we ashamed of Jesus? If we're not willing to die, if we're not willing to lose our life for his sake, and as I told my kids, you get what you get, and you don't want it. The truth is that it's the same death that destroys the power of Satan. Us choosing to wake up every morning and deny ourselves and take up our cross daily actually destroys the work of Satan. When those temptations come and we choose to deny ourselves and take up our cross daily, we're saying, self, you have no power. I am not a slave to you anymore. I'm a slave to Christ. Come on, bro. And we flex that muscle. And guess what? We get stronger. Yeah. We get stronger yeah. and we get stronger. And pretty soon, I don't struggle with that anymore. Right. I've been a Christian for 23 years. There are things that I used to struggle with when I was a baby Christian. I don't even think about it anymore. And there are other things, man, i got to flex every day yeah. just to, like, make it by. Come on, bro. So what should our response be? 
2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 says, For though we live in the world, we do not wage war as the world does. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. On the contrary, they are of divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every pretension, every pretend thing, pretend thought, make-believe thought, imagination, that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. This is our response. We take the weapons God gives us to destroy everything that it sets itself up against God, including our own thoughts, including our own fears. The weapons we fight with are not the weapons of this world. Let's close out here in Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15, look here in verse 21, 17. It says, therefore I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I have said and done, by the power of signs and wonders, through the power of the Spirit of God. So from Jerusalem all the way to Iconium, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. It has always been my ambition to preach the gospel where Christ is not known, so that I would not be building on someone else's foundation. Rather, as it is written, those who are not told about him will see, and those who have not heard will understand. Here was Paul's ambition. The life for which he very well lived the rest of his life for. A fire that was in his bones to preach the word of God to everyone who had not yet heard. He wasn't interested in talking to people that already had salvation. Now he would, and he did, to strengthen them. But his main ambition was to go where no one had gone before. Mm. I know we've reached out to a lot of people since landing out here in prison. But here's the thing. There are a lot more here who have not heard. Yeah, bro. There are a lot more people here who have heard nothing but false doctrine. Yeah. Yeah. We have been called by God, anointed to destroy the work of Satan here in the Central Valley. Yeah. Come on, bro. That call is not just for you, but every single person that you reach out to. Yeah. Moses made the decision to join the resistance. Not only to set the captives free, but to destroy the work of Satan. Yeah. Paul made the decision to join the resistance. Mm. And it had a great impact that is felt even to this day. Now it's time for you and me to once again choose to join the resistance and to God be the glory. Come on. Amen.